authenticity is yeah. is literally the key. Jay Lux Fit. For women who are into fitness is to help empower them and make them feel good when they're training. Inclusivity is such a tick box exercise for many brands. I wouldn't be here half where I am now without my network. I was the perfect customer. I was solving a problem for me. I wasn't solving a problem for anyone else. I was solving it initially just for me. I'm excited to have on this episode, Jordan. She started a brand called J Lux Fit. It's for women who are into fitness, is to help empower them and make them feel good when they're training. But I'm sure there's lots more to it than that. So Jordan, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. No, really, it's really nice. Great. So, um, I mean, I like to start guests off. I'll give you a can. You can have one. Perfect. But thank the, you. <laughs> the, the, the thing we try and find out on this uh, this sort of podcast is it's called Fuel for Founders. So I'm trying to work out what makes people tick, why start a business. It's not as easy as having a job, obviously. You tend to I find the more I do these interviews, you find people who've got a story and often a passion as to why they want to do, you know, do a business in essence. But tell me a bit about yourself. Why start a business for, to start with? Yeah, definitely. So I think I was born to start a business. I know like some people say, some people say that and some people don't, but I think it was always in my blood that I was going to start a business from an early age. I always wanted to have my own business. Yeah. I never really knew what I wanted it to be, but I always knew I wanted to be a founder. So for me, the starting a business bit wasn't a shock um, at, at all, but the way it kind of came about, I suppose, was a little bit of a shock. I think I started J Lux Fit because I struggled um, with my weight loss journey and I really struggled to find active wear um, as a plus size woman. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been through many kind of um, weight loss journeys, I suppose, over a period of time. And for me, the hardest thing was going into a gym as um, and feeling unconfident. Like when there's no, I suppose, people will be able to um, relate to this. Like, when you go into the gym, you automatically think people are looking at you and nobody's looking at you. Nobody cares what you're doing, what you're wearing, what you're there to do. But in my head, I was feeling like everyone was looking at me and I never felt confident with what I was wearing um, when I was there. Everyone else was wearing really nice active wear sets that were matching, but I could never find that in my size. And for me, that was really hard and mentally. And because I wanted to lose the weight, I wanted to feel confident to be able to get to the gym, but I never felt it when I was there. And I found a massive part of that was because of what I wore. Yeah. I think it's a lot of a business starting. I mean, I was similar with my journey with Excite. It was coming from a place of like, I wanted a healthier energy drink that sort of helped with my focus and racing and stuff. But I find a lot of founders, it comes from a place of wanting something for yourself, doesn't it? I think that's where yeah. a lot of the passion comes from a lot of the times. But where did you get like the the idea that you could then start a business like that was it w when you're younger were you entrepreneurial did did you come across anything because this that makes a lot of sense what you said but that's difficult <laughs> then how do you actually go and then do a business this it's quite a tricky process to be you know to decide okay i'm gonna do a clothing brand for starters obviously that was to to help with what you were feeling you wanted something to fit nicer in the gym for you but how did you then go in and start what made you think you know i can do this um I feel like I've always been really, really driven and I've always been quite fearless. So for me, that didn't scare me. The thought of kind of starting a brand or all the research, even though I knew absolutely nothing about starting a clothing brand, yeah. I don't come from that background um, at all. Um, that didn't scare me at all. So I knew that I just had to learn. I had to like dedicate my time now to learn how to start a brand, surround myself with the right people that would help me and ultimately go from there. And this is a journey. Like I'm on a journey still now. Every day is a new, a learning day. So I wouldn't say, um, yeah, I would say that it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult journey, don't get me wrong. But I think that if you want something, you can, you can go and get it. Yeah, no, I think that that's very relevant to sort of how people start. I think, and like, who who were those people then? Who 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 did you think could help you start that journey? Because of course, I guess you got to source some clothing because that's what you want to make. But obviously, you you need to just alter the sizes of them, get the shape and the fit right. I guess you need models for that. But how does someone go about on your journey? What did you then do as your steps to to try and bring that to life? I guess even the brand name. Yeah, of course. Cool. So, so the brand name actually was quite a long process. So the process from like, I would say, start to our first collection was about 
eight to 12 months. That's quite a while um, then. So it was a quite a while. We yeah. did a lot of research because um, I knew that I needed to find manufacturers because everything from J-Lux is, is made as per what we design. So, so you have to do the sizing. Everything, yeah. yeah. So I got a designer in. Ultimately, that was the first thing that we did. A lot of the first stuff were like everything that I imagined in my head. I just sketched out something that I liked. I And I was the perfect customer. Mm -hmm. So what I liked, that was I was solving a problem for me. I wasn't solving a problem for anyone else. I was solving it initially just for me. So it wasn't a case of having to think about, at that point, what really anyone else wanted. I knew what... I liked, I suppose, I knew that the problem was going to solve, uh, that was going to solve my problem. So I was just kind of, it was very basic. Our first collection was quite basic. It mm -hmm. was, it was purely for that purpose. So in regards to design, um, most of it was designed by myself. And then we got a designer in to produce the tech packs and everything else that kept, that comes with bringing a product to market. Um, and, and you then, sort of self-taught yourself that in theory, yeah. Yeah, generally, like a, a lot of self-taught, like online researching, speaking to a couple of like local designers yeah. um, and merchandisers, and finding out what is the process to bring the product to market. What do I need to do? Um, and then putting that into place, f finding those people. Um, a lot of it was free, all freelance, like people that were just helping out. Um, and then finding manufacturers. That was probably the toughest thing was finding good manufacturers and um, and getting the quality right. Yeah, no, I can imagine because I guess that a lot of it's produced, I would imagine, overseas because yes. the UK is not great for that type of business, is it? I don't think from producing clothing. i got some friends who do clothing. A lot of it's abroad, isn't it? Yeah, all amazed. overseas yeah. at the moment. Um, we couldn't, the price point for us wasn't there for, um, for the UK market, yeah. but also... The, because of the sizes that we offer as well, we we offer um, obviously up to 3XL, which is part part and parcel um, of the brand. And that just wasn't something that that they could offer. So for us, we had to kind of go go where everyone else is going, you know? Yeah. Now, it's something I've, I've found resonant through a lot of the interviews I've done. There's always like this why behind brands and sort mm. of why are they trying to do what they're doing. And obviously, for you, it's empowering women, I guess, is the core focus of your brand. What sort of made you go into that arena with, with your clothing? Because I guess you could have, was there other clothing brands at the time in that space or was there really no one really catering to, to I guess, you the customer at that point? So I found myself that there wasn't anyone that was catering to, at that point, to my price point. Okay. The biggest oh, issue. Okay, interesting. So, so yeah. the price point you picked so up you on had, that. So you did have some brands that would offer kind of plus size active wear. Yeah. Um, but the price point was sort of high, high end sign of 80, 90 pounds for a pair of leggings. And at that point I was, wow, well, I'd just come out of just school. Going, so yeah, like, man. yeah. So I, I was um, employed, but I wasn't earning a lot at that point at all. And I didn't want to spend 90 pounds on a pair of leggings. No, to go fresh to go, friend the yeah. gym. Yeah. And, you know, I felt that, I felt that even so that it wasn't worth what I was spending it on. And I felt that no one was doing it because, they wanted to do in it. They were doing it because they had to. It was a tick box exercise. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like inclusivity is such a tick box exercise for many brands. They don't, it's not, it's not coming from the core. It's not the core reason. So then of um, course the fit's not so right. Then, yeah, and, yeah and exactly. This, that sort of stuff. And that's what I found. Uh, if I found the active wear, I found that I was buying it and then um, the fit wasn't right, like you said, and kind of, um, especially for a woman, like my, it didn't fit my bust and it wouldn't be good for a hit workout, yeah, especially. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and that wasn't a good look in the gym and that does not make you feel good. No. So you can imagine like trying to run, um, in something that's too flimsy is not ideal. No, no. And I guess it's that impairment, isn't it? Cause like you said, you want to be there. You want to feel good when you're doing it. And I know when I go to the gym is if my <laughs> biceps are good, I'll do another set. Do you know what I mean? It's just part of it, isn't it? Um, but say, so did you take, you've, you've sort of sourced your clothing, you've done your tech packs, you design what you want. You start getting some orders in. How did you grow the business? Because obviously, I assume it's D to C. Yes. Um, and it was it a case of obviously websites? Did you design those? Learn about how did that part happen? Because I think a lot of people struggle. They can often overthink that step. I find and think that it's impossible to do websites to ship stuff. How do they do it? But it often can be easy. And you think, but did you find that easy or? Yeah, I did it all. I yeah. did absolutely <laughs> everything. Um, I designed the website. We've probably on like our sixth website, I would say now. Yeah. Um, and we moved over to Shopify probably after, um, well, 
after quite a lot of websites, we moved over to Shopify from like someone else recommending that that was kind of the best one to go with. And we were like, yeah, we'll give it a try. Um, so yeah, website for me was quite easy. I'm quite good at learning that sort of thing. Technical yeah. and things like that for me, I don't find difficult. I still manage most of the website myself now. Okay. Um, just cause I know what I like. And Shopify is good, isn't it? I and find. it's so, yeah, so easy. So do you, you take your brand onto Shopify what do you do then? Because you've got to market this product. You've got to get, obviously, people to show that it's, the quality's good. I guess, was you being the brand ambassador at the time for, for the products? Or? Yeah, so for about four months into the brand, I really struggled with my mental health. So I really struggled to get in front of the camera and be the front of the brand. So for me, that period was really difficult. I then kind of one day decided that I needed to like get over that and really kind of put myself as the founder of JLux Fit, and this is why we're doing it. And... um and after that, it kind of just um, really stepped up a game. Um, I started to really showcase the reasoning behind the brand, the inclusivity, the empowerment, and also the community. For us, JLux Fit is built on a community and the community is just growing. Um, and when people come in, they feel part of the community and that's what's so great about it. So how we've kind of grown to that is very much through influencer marketing. Okay. Um, so influencer marketing something I've done previously in roles as well. Um, and marketing is kind of a little bit of my background. So um, influencer marketing, we found influencers that were really relatable and really connected with, with JLux Fit. Initially, we would kind of gift them items um, and see what they thought of it. There was no pressure for them to post. It was very much like, would you like to try our product? Can you tell us what you think of it? Do you like it? Does it fit well? And, and naturally... Most people loved the product and then posted about it, which was absolutely fantastic. And for us, the influencer process took a while. Um, it's about finding the right influencer avatar is what I kind of call it. Okay. And then once you kind of find that, you can then find relatable influencers that kind of are like that. And for me, like our influencers are our community. They're on our team. We literally speak all the time. Um, we meet with them we do things with them. They're literally like my friends. Um, like I had one influence around the other day. We were doing like a TikTok at my house and um, we had dinner and it's like, it's they are part of the community. It's really lovely. Community is such a big thing for brands, I think, though, mm. isn't it? How do you start building a community? You've given a few tips away there, but you've got the influencers which are getting your brand awareness. But how do you make your customers feel part of that? It's quite difficult to to do sometimes, I think, as a brand authenticity is yeah. is literally the key just being authentic being relatable and being yourself and showcasing that i think really showcasing your core values as, as a brand and making sure that shows through every aspect that that you're doing so your marketing your website your influencers your pr everything you're doing needs to be authentic to your true values of the of the brand and i think that will then showcase to your customers and your community and start to build that community mm. um what, what were your values then is is jada because obviously it's, it's about empowering women to get to the gym but did you find they was resonating in other areas and is was there like a food element to it was there guides and things or was it strictly just just within the fitness clothing community you was building that that niche I think for us, our kind of core values are inc inclusivity. Ultimately, yeah. that's our biggest core value is that diverse, the inclusive and feeling a part of something. Um, people love to feel a part of something. People love to really connect with other people. Um, and and I think when they come on board, kind of being a JLux Fit customer, they feel like that. They can speak to me, you know, Um and they see what I do in my day. They see what Chelsea does. And people feel like they can relate because we're just normal people. There's no kind of, um, I don't know, it's just really, like really sales normal. Sales message, yeah, copy, emails really, and Yeah, all that. it's just so normal. And we just kind of present ourselves in in every single way that's relatable. And that, that showcases. And I feel like that's what people really love about us. Um, and we invite them to, so... For example, when we do our influencer collections, which is a big part of um, how we kind of release um, our, our capsule drops, um, is we partner and we collaborate with influencers. Um, so what's a capsule drop? What's so that? a capsule drop for us would be a drop within the year that's kind of not based on a season. It's kind of just dropped. Normally it's an influencer collaboration. Okay. Um, and so we'll they help design it a bit or... 
Exactly, from the start. Like, it oh. is all done with them. So from the get-go, we're actually looking at one at the moment, and they can't believe that from the get-go they are involved in that full design process. Mm. And they get an input. It's their collection. Oh, sorry. It's, their, sorry, it's their collection. Um, and they get full input on on it. And that is so... I didn't know that, that it was done any other way. Yeah. Um, I just thought that was how influencer collections happened, you know. And that works really, really well um, for us. But it also means that they feel so a part of, of, of the collection. It's theirs. It's their colors. It's their designs. Obviously, we help along the way. And they have a chat with our designers. Um, and we do all the kind of leg, leg work in the design process. But it's really, really nice that they can see their idea come to life. It's authenticity again, it though, is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's that authentic part. If it's because I've seen it before with brands, they pay for an influencer to endorse a product, but you can tell it's just that endorsed thing. It doesn't. It doesn't resonate really. And I think we're almost past that. I know TikTok. There's some trends going on now of like anti-influencers where they're mm. de-influencing brands. You know, what I mean, they're like, don't buy this shit because we wouldn't. And it's quite interesting how it's changing. I think with influencers. Yeah, I think people forget they're just real people. Mm. They still like to buy stuff. They, if they see a top in Zara, they're going to buy it. Like, you know, people, influencers are real people. And I think sometimes people kind of don't don't see that. And, you know, it's really nice to be, obviously, to be able to see that. But um, influencers still want to buy things from brands. They they love what they love. So you've just kind of got, got to get your brand in front of them because they must get thousands of messages a day, you know, like thousands and I suppose making your brand or your company stand out, it's got to be something that's relatable to them. So we, for example, had an influencer message us about collaborating who was who would be gr potentially great for another brand, but not for us. Okay. And, you know, they might have millions of followers, but if they don't relate to what we are or who we are or relate to like what we're not going to collaborate with them because we think, wow, it's another influencer. You know, we want it. We want to collaborate with people who will love our brand, love our product and that our customers relate to because it's pointless. Our customers will be like, well, why, why is that person? They, they're nothing, they're not relatable or they're nothing to do with, you know, J-Lux. So why would they be promoting J-Lux? It's, it's not authentic. And ultimately I think the key to, building good influencer partnerships is is authenticity it's a cool it's quite cool you say that because i had a guest on uh previously that was talking about they was offered a man united sponsorship for a football game um but they were telling me the story and i was like well you definitely take that then surely because it was free i think it was like up before a game and they couldn't get someone to fill the space and then we declined it because we were the brand to to basically get people training so we were a training brand we weren't you know, that's the athlete, the fin that's the finishing line. We're not about the finish line, we're about the start. It's quite early because you're you're quite an early brand, was it 2020? 2020, 2020, 2020. Yeah. And to define that goal and stick to it that exclusively, because I've had it before, you know, when you get a big influence and it's hard to say no to people of course. For, for the for the following, do you know what I mean? But this funnily enough, everyone thinks it's about the followers. It's completely not. You could have someone with a million followers promote your brand and maybe get 10 followers, but you can have someone with 50 followers, but 30% of those followers are really actively engaging with that person. And you're going to get way more engagement because they're going to naturally like the product because that, that person's community is really authentic to what they like. So if it's relatable to the influencer and it's something that they would like, their community is probably going to like it too. Where, whereas if it's someone with, a million followers, but doesn't have, you know, their community don't follow them because they want to see what they wear or they just follow them because they follow them. You're probably not going to find that you're going to get as much engagement, even though there's, you know, hundreds and thousands of more people there. They're not engaged by that particular type of content. They might be engaged by a different type of content. So it all boils down to the content and the relatability to what they're posting i guess yeah no it makes a lot of sense you built your brand obviously online digital community yes. building community how did it how did growing team for you work is there a team is it just you at jlex now or have you got a is there other people on your team how did you build that out as a business yeah so we got four people at the moment yeah. um it, we built it really slowly to be honest i started off actually um employing one of our influencers because i got <laughs> <laughs> this is what i mean see i've become so 
close friends, but she was had a great platform and they really resonated with um, J Lux. And when I first gifted her product, she literally automatically fell in love with fell in love with it, promoted us everywhere. Um, there was no like paid um, going on. She was literally, she just loved the product and shared about it basically. And her followers did as well, which was really great. And off the back of that, we decided to bring out a collection. That was our first um, collection that we did with an influencer. And it went really, really well. And we gr obviously grew quite a lot of followers from that, which was great. And off the back of that, I was like, I really need some help now. Yeah. Because um, I guess, was you did, where was you posting it? Was you doing the whole labels and sending it yourself thing and all of no, that? No, no, no. So we, we got a fulfillment centre quite early on. Nice. So... That's also through networking. So I think networking for me, I've done networking for years because that was part of my previous um, full-time role. So I knew quite a lot of people in business mm -hmm. and I learned a lot from others. Um, yeah. I just listened and listened and listened. And you can learn so much from your community. And someone said to me, you're going to need to get a fulfillment center. Do it early. Then you won't have the hassle. And I was like, what is a fulfillment center? <laughs> <laughs> And then obviously... Dark art. I don't know how it works, but it <laughs> yeah. all seems to end up the right place. Yeah, exactly. And um, and yeah, so luckily, funnily enough, um, one of my friends, um, who's a, who is an influencer as well, she was like, um, our friend has got this fulfillment centre that he started a couple of months ago, you know, um, would, you, would you be interested in having a conversation with him? And I was like, oh, yeah, all right then. So had a conversation with him. He, he said, yeah, put the products in there, fine. So at that point, I know, we'd only just done like our first collection drop. So it was super, super early. I was like, you know, we might not get a sale every day. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what's <laughs> yeah, coming in. Yeah. Don't know what's coming in. Not really sure how this is going to go, but yeah, that would be great if you can store the products instead of having it in my spare bedroom. And literally. it gives you the time to do the marketing and the sales anyway then, doesn't it? Exactly. And actually I was surprised. I think everyone thinks that fulfillment centers are quite expensive it's actually cheaper for us to have a fulfillment center than it is to have a warehouse plus staff in the warehouse and then all of the overheads. Mm. And it means, like you say, you can focus on doing what you do best. I can focus on doing what I do best. And, you know, you've got that support. You also get kind of, well, they've, they're doing it for other brands. So they pick up on things a lot quicker than, you know, what I, for example, with all the strikes that went on, that would have been super difficult if I didn't have them. Um, yeah, to switch they, carriers. They've and got all the that experience. Sort of they're doing it. Um, so yeah, that was it's, it. Was the probably the best decision that I made early on. In the the networking, then you you've had previous experience with that. But how much has that impacted your business? Do you think is networking a core part of why J Lux is successful? Because there is competition in your industry, isn't there? I can imagine there's loads of people trying it. Maybe even taking inspiration from you and copying some elements. But do you think your network really helped in that? process massively i wouldn't be here half where i am now without my network um it's been a key part of my, our growth j lux's growth my personal growth as well mm -hmm. um and i think i learned like i said i learned a lot from people um really early on and off the back of that got recommended to speak to i'll go and speak to this person he's done this or go and speak to her she's really great in this industry and you know my accountant that i use now is from my first networking group that i ever went to <laughs> really? yeah and so it's little things like that and what's your advice for people to get in and network because that's partly why i started this podcast noticing i was in networks yeah that provided me so much value and i was like well if people could discuss how they do that what was your method did you, did you have I guess similar to influencers. How did you get in their DMs and get to that event or whatever? Um, just turning up. Like you can literally book networking group local ones online. Yeah. So some of them will might not be right for you as like an entrepreneur or a founder, but off the back of that, you'll meet people who might be able to recommend you into other networking groups, which might benefit you more. You know, the networking groups that I went to previously for my um, old job were more kind of service based. Um, but off the back of that, they worked really well for JLux because I met loads of people who could ultimately do the services, do the services that yeah, I needed. Yeah. yeah. So that was really great. But I got to know them really, really well, um, which was fantastic. But yeah, just booking, you can literally go online and you can see networking groups that are local to you. There's quite a lot that are big in different areas, you know, some of the bigger networking clubs and, and things. But I found... 
that I've been, when I've gone and I've got to know people and not got to know people really on a business level, more of like a personal. I always say that networking is getting to know someone on a personal level before you talk about business. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you get to kind of know them and also introduce them to people because they're then more likely to help you out. Um, And you never know, do you, with conversations, I guess, where you could end up in that when you're chatting with people, like say, if you get to know them, they're like, oh, well, my friend does this and so-and-so does this and it can lead you down different paths then, I guess. Yeah, and I've pushed at every opportunity. If someone asked me for a one-to-one, they could be, I, even if I think this isn't going to be a benefit to me, I'll go, I'll go to the appointment or I'll have the Zoom call and I'll spend an hour or half an hour or two hours speaking to them because you just never know what's going to happen in that conversation. It might not be them, but it, like you said, it could be their friend, it could be their partner or someone else that they can recommend you to and say, oh, do you know what? That That's going to be perfect for you to speak to them. Yeah. So I would say don't turn down any opportunities um, because you never know what's around the corner. Yeah, no, it's very true. And I think I've been surprised when I've gone and spoke to people. And, you know, I, um, a guy who was on my podcast earlier today, um, I just went to a networking event in London, got chatting to him, and then, you know, you connect, and we we use into cars, so we was talking about cars for ages, and I'm like, well, what else do you do? And obviously got a big business there. But yeah, it's interesting, and you can run into, and I think you can never sort of put a value to that, I don't think. No, definitely not. There is no, for me, like I said, networking has been incredible. I continue to do it, and now I kind of network with um, female founders, which I find really, really great, Um which is something that I, I want to continue doing because I think it can be really hard um, as an entrepreneur, as anyone. But I've always found that naturally females will speak to me about business now. And I was like, well, I want to be able to support others in in doing things and what can we do to learn off each other? Because there's so many people that I've met that, like I said, I've learned from. And putting those people in front of other people like me is what I want to be able to do. You know, I think that's really, really nice. So I think it's it's as important as ever. Yeah, it's an aspirational thing as well, isn't it, I think? It gets lonely as well, do you know what I mean? Entrepreneurship is lonely and it's hard. And most of the time, nobody understands what you're doing, why you're doing it. And you've got no one else to, especially I didn't really have anyone else to speak to. Um, and so those people knew exactly how you felt. So from like a mental health perspective, perspective that was a big thing to be able to go into a room where you weren't judged for wanting to create this business you know where everyone was rooting for you yeah I can I think that's a lot of the thing with again having those network groups they can be supportive we I've got one in London I go to there's only six of us go for dinner we just sit sit there for two hours just telling them all our shit about what our (laughs) problems are but sometimes just someone listening to all the problems you've got it can be uh it can be very useful for a founder but what challenges have you faced in the industry I don't know a huge deal about women's clothing obviously but I know I've seen online that there's this transitioning thought especially even maybe in your sector with plus size clothing of like um, you know, there's there's phobias around sort of where the industry was pushing and then it's gone bad. But how have you found the your industry moving with fitness and female fashion, I guess, in that industry? Yeah, so I think um, athlete leisure is like quite a big, it's a very big industry. Mm. And I think a lot of the fitness style clothing is now turning into that athlete leisure day where people are wearing it every day, you know, not just to the gym, to the shops, to the school run. It has turned into that yeah. sort of where it is everywhere isn't it it's that sort of thing now which is great ultimately for me it's great um and it's great that people feel confident to be able to do that um in regards to kind of the plus size industry um i think that for me we've been inclu- we've been inclusive from the get go which was what ultimately why i started so i think some people are like well people are focusing either too much on the plus size or too or too much in the mainstream i think if you're um brand showcases that you can cover or you want to cover those sizes. I think a lot of brands, like I said before, it's a tick box exercise. That's where it goes wrong. And I that's think. where it, but the customers know that they know when you're trying to do that. I I knew when people were trying to do that because what it didn't fit right to you're like, has anyone actually tried this before they sold it? Yeah. <laughs> um, because this is not good. Uh, so I just think that if brands do do that, they're quickly going to be exposed to this, um, I don't know, it's going to be detrimental for them, ultimately. So if they're going to do it, they might as well do it properly. Um, but I, I found that not many brands have been doing that, which ultimately was why 
I started J Lux Fit. So yeah, I think the industry is huge. It's only going to grow. Um, and I think there's room for loads of competition. Do you know what I mean? The, the market in, in fashion is saturated, but if you've got something that's different or if people like you, then there's, there's room to, to be there. Yeah. And especially if you're wise, correct, like you said, and I mean, it's partly what got me into exile. I was at that age in health and fitness, um, going to the gym a lot. And it was almost became that transition when going to the gym was more people went to the gym and went to the pub. She's not doing pubs very good these days, but it has been that change in forever focus, hasn't it? But what's next for, for J-Lux? I mean, what's your plans? You're obviously growing in the UK, I assume. Do you ship abroad now? And, and what's your, your plans there? Yeah, so we do ship abroad. Um, we ship um, everywhere at the moment. There's just a few um, places that we don't, um, very small places. But yeah, so J-Lux is growing. We're trying to ultimately grow our UK first. That's always been the plan, is that we really tackle the UK and then look to to grow overseas as well. Um, we see ourselves as being the inclusive activewear brand, you know, really getting a name for ourselves and, and showcasing that um, inclusivity and our true values and having fun and building our community. The community is at, is at the core of what we do and it always will be. So this year we've got a lot of new things that we're doing. We're bringing out a lot of new collections and trying lots of new styles because we've been very... I think part of our kind of brand development is bit we've we've kept to our kind of core um, collections uh, for a long time, and we haven't brought out too many things out of the ordinary. Because, and that was probably the best tip that I learned early on to do that. Because you really find what your customers like and don't like, and then you haven't gone over the top too soon. Whereas now we can really start trialing some more like athlete leisure items okay. with our customers. So that'll be really nice to be able to kind of grow as a brand and grow our collection pieces, um, especially our core collection, which our core collection is what stays in stock all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's like your leggings, your tops, all that sort of stuff, yeah? Yeah, so that currently consists of only four products, whereas that, by the end of this year, that should be at 16 products. Um, so we're really kind of doubling down and, and getting those getting those products out there. And then we, we just will continue to grow our influencer capsule collections, which we've got plans till the end of 2024 for those. So, yeah, massive, massive couple of no, years. No, it's really. exciting. Yeah, really exciting. Sounds very exciting. I'd like to finish on something a bit more personal that you've picked up on then is, is mental health for founders. Obviously, you said you've transitioned to that as you're growing your business, probably different stages of it. What do you do now to support your mental health? What's key for you to... Because you've got to get up every day, you've got to lead your team, you've got to make sure, you know, your community's growing, all the ambassadors on board. What do you do as a founder to keep yourself fit and healthy? Is it just gym or what's your strategies for people? Um, I don't have like a necessarily big strategy, but I would definitely say going to the gym helps me. Yeah. Um, it helps me getting that kind of mind zone. I love a podcast. So listening and kind of just coming out of the day to day and just for an hour and just like going on a walk, listening to a podcast getting a bit of fresh air um, and generally going for a coffee with like one of my friends. I love kind of getting out and seeing people and having, having a chat. And I feel like that seeing people side of things for me is really nice taking myself out because I've worked for the last three years, so many hours when I was still working my full time running J Lux and doing all of that, you know, now being able to step away for an hour and being able to do that is really, really nice. So I would say take, take that hour or half an hour or 20 minutes just to do something for you every single day. Yeah. So that could be reading a book, walking, you know, gym. I try to do that every single day so that I know I've done something for me that day. And how do you find the hustle culture vibe come into that? It's quite topical at the minute <laughs> saying you should get up at five and then there's almost anti-hustle now. It's like, nah, stay until 10 o'clock and then wake up. What's your view on work? Are you sort of an entrepreneur that thinks, you know, you've got to work all the time. And is that a focus for you or how have you found it? Do whatever you love. For me, I, lo I love like working. Um, I wouldn't say I'm like up at every morning at five, not, yeah, yeah. not <laughs> these days, but like I do love working. I struggle to switch off. I'll be, if we sit down in the evening to watch a bit of TV, I will not want to be there and I want to be on my laptop replying to something or doing something or learning. So for me, I, I wouldn't, I don't see it as, a hustle culture in the fact that it's annoying me. I do it because I love it. Um, and I think do what feels right. If you've, you know, when you've got a hustle, ultimately, I know when I've got to sit there and I've got to do things that I don't want to do and really kind of get to that grind. And some days, you know, you think, Oh, I don't want to do that today, 
um, and you put it off. But the more I kind of put it off, the the worse it gets. I think at one point when I was absolutely manic, I had like 160 WhatsApp messages. And that for me was seriously overwhelming. And one day (laughs) I was just like, I just need to respond to them. And ever since I've been on it, but because I put it off for so long, it almost, the buildup was giving me anxiety that I had to actually get to that day and do it. Yeah. So I think just don't, don't put it off. Just do what you need to do. And if you want to hustle, hustle. If you don't want to hustle, don't, you know, it's your decision ultimately. And it's your life. I find a lot of people that have come on the podcast have said that, but they always gravitate back to is, yeah, I work all the time, <laughs> but they don't want to say it as such, but it does seem quite trendy. But then they, it's always because of passion, really. It's not because you're being forced to, is it? It's because you want to do it. But what would your advice be, you know, for someone like you, a young girl, 20 at a uni, or maybe just finishing a job a bit later in the 20s? What um, what would your advice be if they're thinking, you know, they want to start a business? Would you take the risk again? And what would your advice be to those people? 100% I take the risk again. Um, my advice would be grow your community, grow your network, start to speak to people who are in business. You can really learn so, so much from other people and don't take that for granted. There's so much free information online that you can learn, you know, Google do loads of courses, LinkedIn courses. There's lots, if, as long as you spend the time and you really truly want it, you will, you will do, you will do it. You'll spend the time doing it. Um, And yeah, like I said, grow that network, start to meet with people and just start to write down your idea. Like get get the idea out on paper. So there's nothing worse when it's up in your head because it's constantly changing. And I and I found that by telling someone, I almost then had to do it. Okay. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Because you're like, oh, I can't go not not go through with this now. I said I'm going to do it. So yeah, I'm doing it. (laughs) That's a good, a good idea, actually. And it, I found, it was, I think it was, um, someone said to me, it's like ideas you put on a shelf and then if they nag you enough, you do them. Do you know what I mean? And it's a bit like that. But would you would you have been able to do a business you don't think that you had that core resonance with? Obviously, it was something that you wanted. Could you have started, a, like you said, you were on, you thought you'd always start a business. Would you have just then found a niche and started or do you think it had to be that for you, something that you, you felt passionate about? Definitely had to be something that I felt passionate about, yeah, because I wouldn't have been hustling if I didn't I don't think I don't think I could but I don't know maybe it's not really something that I've thought about but if you've got that passion and that purpose and the reasoning behind it it's so much more authentic isn't it and it helps that journey and it comes across in everything you do so I would say that really helps but there isn't a reason I would say you could you could not have a passion for something but still want to do it um so yeah why why not? If you if you really want to do it, you'll do it. But thanks for coming on. It was insightful. I think people are learning a lot about that. Where can they find J Lux if they're interested in your products or interested in you or the brand? Well, we'll pop the handles below, but is it jlux.com or what's your... Yeah, jluxfit.com um, and also jluxfit on Instagram and same on Facebook and TikTok. Um, and then you can find me at jord underscore jluxfit on, um, on Instagram as well. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed a bit of that insight into a brand that I think is really going to be a strong brand in this fitness sector, empowering women to do more with their lives. But yeah, really good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Right, cheers.